Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending this uh, final, or well, close to final session of uh, today. We're going to be talking about new methods of ad monetization in the mobile game market. Uh, I, myself, uh, am the business development manager for Aiden Games. We're an indie game development company. Uh, I won't be speaking too much. I'm just going to make the uh, introductions and uh, then leave the stage to our experts in their respective fields. We're t uh, today, we're joined by Holly Bartlett, Alp Kaya, and Gary Sonyak. Um, so before we begin, as we begin, rather, uh, I'd like to leave the stage and the word to the panelists. So uh, why don't you tell us about yourselves, your companies, uh, what you do. Let's get to know you guys a little bit. And um, what incentivized you, to, what you know, motivated you to progress in the area that you've chosen to? Why don't you uh, start with you, Gary, since you have the mic. Hi. It's working. It's magic. So yeah, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to to hear, be here. Uh, let me start with uh, how I you know just got into this field because uh, actually it's a it's a funny story. Um, I was a pretty good FIFA player, by the way, ages ago, of course, and uh, I played a lot uh, with my friends, uh, but offline, um, PS4 and PS3. So it was really ages ago, and. Uh, uh, this uh, one, one night I just dropped uh, this kind of idea that uh, guys, why we don't you know just play for for real money? And uh, everybody just agreed that um, we started to play for real money. And uh, believe it or not, we finished it 6 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> because it was so fun to play for real money. And uh, of course, uh, after you know a few weeks, just uh, crossed my mind that uh, probably we are not only those crazy guys who want to play for real money with uh, video games. And uh, believe it or not, I got in touch with uh, EA Sports, <laughs> but uh, they have never replied. <laughs> so uh, after a few months, uh, I founded Gamer Pro, uh, and that's how I got into this uh, mobile games market. But uh, let me talk a bit about GamerPro. So GamerPro is a new monetization method for mobile games. And uh, we organize crash price tournaments in uh, directly in the games. It's a new and fun competitive uh, gameplay for the users, which uh, retains the users and uh, generates a new revenue stream. So I will explain how we generate revenue through uh, our test game because uh, we develop the test game for our future partners to give them uh, an easy access to, you know, to try out our service because uh, it's not as easy to implement to to the games as like in Mobi SDK, uh, so it uh, take takes more time. So. Let's back to the test game. So imagine a game where the users uh, play for scores. And based on that score, they get a rank on this uh, cash prized leaderboard. And uh, if the users cannot win real money, then they can practice with the game for free. But of course, for that, they need to watch an ad, at least. It's a kind of you know rewarded video. Uh, but if the users can uh, win real money, they need to submit their scores on the leaderboard. But for do that, they need to purchase tickets. Um, of course, all the purchases go to the prize pool because uh, it would be, uh, the users making it you know even bigger during the competition. But we cut a commission from all the purchases. Uh, that's how we generate revenue. Or with that, uh, with the business uh, model, and uh, as you see, our revenue strongly depends on the price pool. So that's why we designed it uh, crowdfunded, without any limitations, because we observed in the last couple of years that uh, if the price pool is bigger, it uh, motivates more users to play and. Uh, of course, more users to purchase. And as I mentioned, all the purchases go to the price pool, 
making it even bigger, which uh, generates more revenue. So that's uh, in a real nutshell about uh, how I got into this field and uh, what is Gamer Pro. Thank you. So hey guys, uh, welcome. Thanks for being here today. My name is Alp Kaya and I'm leading the gaming partnerships and non-gaming partnerships here in Turkey for Immobi. Uh, for those who don't know who Immobi is, Immobi is one of the biggest exchanges and SSPs in the world. And what we basically do is we uh, help our publisher partners to successfully monetize their games uh, via our West Global Demand. And how I got into this business uh, I've always considered myself as a as a gamer and I wanted to know how games are being monetized, how the game economies actually work. And I thought monetization would be a good way to get to know a lot of uh, gaming publishers so I can uh, increase my knowledge and help Imobi to expand uh, our business. Cool. Um, I also don't have a super exciting story like Gary had with his FIFA and then... Um getting into the gaming industry. My name's Holly. Um, I am the director of gaming partnerships for a monetization company called Kindred. Um, I look after all of our gaming partnerships uh, across loads of different territories. And um, I got into gaming about a year and a half ago. I would say by chance, I'm not gonna lie. And I'm so lucky, I think. I've uh, really enjoyed my time. I find it such a great industry where everyone is really friendly. Like. When I tell my friends about the sorts of people I meet at work, they're very jealous. Like everyone is so kind and is happy to make any introduction. And I, I really appreciate that. And I love going to all these events and getting to travel the world with my job. Uh, so a little bit about Kindred. Um, we are an alternative monetization solution. We enable publishers to earn revenue every single time their users are shopping in their mobile browser. So we consider ourselves the world's first external app monetization solution, which is a mouthful. But what that means is that we enable publishers to earn revenue when their users are no longer playing their game. So your users, um, as like a user experience perspective, your users would come, they're playing your game, they see some call to action for a shopping browser extension. So this is introduced to them and usually the players are given a reward for activating the extension and um, they activate it. It's a one-time activation. And from that point forward, every time they shop, they will see a pop-up in their browser. So they go to like Nike.com, Adidas, whatever, one of our brand partners, we have 250,000. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sit here and name them clearly, um, but no, we, oh yeah, <laughs> with a full hour. Um, no, no, so they go to like Adidas, let's say, and they see a pop-up that will have the logo of your game and then something that says like, this deal is active. So they know that they're gonna get a reward back in the game for this purchase. They also know that they're gonna have access to coupon codes at checkout. So the players benefited because they are able to save money when shopping online. They can also progress further in the game with more rewards. Um, the publishers benefited because they're able to uh, earn commission every single time their users are shopping externally to their app. So it's a brand new revenue stream that's just incremental sitting on top of everything they already do with IAA, IAP. And yeah, it's a complimentary new revenue stream. The other kind of key thing about our business is we were founded few years ago with the core aim of being the largest donor to ESG initiatives around the world. Um, so at the core of what we do is driving donations seamlessly to ESG initiatives. 51% of our profits go straight to the most important causes around the world and we enable publishers to opt in to do the same. So yeah, that's a bit about me and Kindred. Uh, yeah, it's truly great that um, I was given the chance to moderate this panel. Uh, like I said, uh, I'm the business development manager for Aiding Games, uh, briefly. I'll give my company a shout out as well, since everyone's doing it. Um, we're an indie company uh, based in Istanbul. Uh, we primarily focus on hyper-casual games, but we're currently in the transitional state where we're moving, we're moving towards more casual games and more web 3 games. Now, about the topic, methods of ad monetization. Obviously, I'm not from a background like my panelists here. Um, so this was very interesting for me as well. I'm also here and excited to learn about the new methods and trends. And uh, with having said that, I'd like to thank the, take this opportunity to 
thank the organizers, the sponsors, and obviously my dear panelists for taking their time out of their busy schedule. And of course, you guys for attending to uh, hear about the new trends and new methods of ad monetization in a very competitive, uh, very dynamic market, I'm assuming. So uh, with that said, let's look at the, let's maybe quickly recap last year, 2021, 2022, very active, very turbulent market, a lot of quick shifts in dynamics uh, and trends, very, uh, you know, hectic. Uh, maybe let's have an overview of that. Let's talk about the status of the market of the past years, and then uh, we'll move on from there. Um, anyone can take the stage here. I maybe if you'd like to. I, I feel like this is your yeah. a bit more your up your alley, more your more of your expertise. So uh, I cannot speak from a publisher's point of view, but we get to uh, know a lot of publishers, so I can say that I have an overview about the industry. So uh, definitely, the economics of the economic effects were were effective. Like uh, from the smaller publishers, what I hear is. The venture capital studios are have become more picky uh, because the money is obviously tight, and IAP purchases are expected to uh, drop at some uh, degree. I cannot say it for all the publishers, but the general trend that I heard was that. And the most interesting, I would say, we started to see new genres like mixed genres. For example, we saw a shift. Uh, from hyper-casual to hybrid casual or arcade idol or more like puzzle games. So uh, we can safely say that the smaller publishers have become, uh, have started shifting towards uh, genres where retention is actually more important than gaining, uh, acquiring new users. So lifetime value from a user have, has become more important than uh, constantly acquiring new users, I would say. So from our side, yeah, that's, that's the main, main, main trend that I've, Scene. I feel like uh, most of the efforts of like ad uh, advertisement during direct marketing strategies, they've always been directed towards gaining new users, user ex user acquisition, user acquisition. But now the shift is trying to keep pre-existing users and increase retention. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. And also in-app purchases, uh, studios are trying to more like clever ways to implement uh, in-app purchase. So it's like don't put your eggs into one basket, right? So if, if like the economy goes goes bad, if the advertisers like r reduce their activities, you can still monetize through IAP. So that's what I uh, hear as a, as the best working method from from the publishers that I've uh, spoken to. All right, more like quality over quantity exactly, in the yeah. new and you know upcoming trends, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Wonderful. Definitely. Anything you guys like to add? Um, one thing I would say, just off the back of what you were saying there about publishers moving from just doing in-app advertising to also adding in-app purchases, I would say I can see that from our side as an alternative solution. It's definitely been gaining traction over the last year. And I think publishers are looking for new opportunities. Like of, it, it's becoming more difficult to rely simply on advertising, even in hyper casual. And as you were saying, the emergence of hybrid casual and other kind of in-between monetization strategies does you know, support us, of course, because people are looking for new ways to monetize and they are looking for new diverse revenue streams coming from different sources just than like plain advertising. So um, for us, that's been positive, but um, obviously, yeah, that's the trend I've seen. I would say as well, there's been quite a lot of consolidation of the market. So I can imagine, this is just my own opinion, but I can imagine as a small kind of indie studio or maybe self-published, I think it must be quite a daunting place at the moment because the the market like has increasingly become consolidated and there are these really large corporations that now kind of dominate and I think that yeah I just think that must be quite scary. But, yeah. Especially from a small publisher or small developer com uh, standpoint, going into that market is such a daunting task, like you said, because it's so consolidated and there's just like a couple of giants that dictate everything that goes on in the market. So it's definitely very frightening for you know newcomers. Uh, oh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, our service is not so uh, deeply involved into the into the ad industry. But of course, uh, we use this traditional uh, revenue stream as well. Uh, but um, yeah, I can agree with you guys that uh, publishers and uh, and uh, game uh, developers are looking for new methods and new opportunities, which uh, obviously it's good for our business. And uh, yeah, we are here to to share. Uh, with this new revenue stream, what we have developed uh, with all the stakeholders in this industry. 
So despite coming from different backgrounds, um, we, we can all agree that it has definitely affected all aspects of ad monetization and uh, directed marketing and stuff like that. So uh, in your opinions, what do you guys see the short-term trends of that being like? Like, what do you think is going to happen in the short term in the market? What do you think, what type of methods will be effective in the near future? Or And uh, well, I mean, the follow-up question is directly related to that as well. And what do you think the long-term trends will be? Will there be a change in current methods or will it be like will will the status quo be protected and will that just keep going on what do you guys think about that uh, well, let me start uh with uh the short term actually you know i don't uh, believe that so uh, super surprisingly things will be happening in the next couple of uh, months or years because uh, the trends is obvious uh the the devices the number of devices, I mean, smartphones and uh, tablets are increasing rapidly, and uh, the new generation, it's uh, you know, it's getting it uh, and consume uh, the ads and, and everything because you know the the device is new for them. So obviously, they pop up uh, on app stores and play stores and download as many games as they can and watch uh, the ads. Uh, so yeah, in in short term, I think uh, it uh, it will continue. It will persist. But let's talk about the long the long term uh, after after the yeah. So uh, from our side, obviously the ATT regulations affected the industry uh, also um, quite a lot. So what I can say, there are some trends that are here to elevate the the, the industry. Basically, one of them being the SK at network integration. So. From the advertisers' point of view, advertisers do actually some, and majority of the advertisers do actually bid on on inventory, which is SK, which has SK at network enabled, and also having an SK at network enabled uh, works for for the publishers as well because they can. Uh, it's a last click attribution, obviously, as you guys know. So it helps publishers to or advertisers to know where that uh, attribution last attribution came from. So also publishers uh, do want to acquire iOS users because they tend to spend more compared to Android users, I would say. The second one, the second trend, uh, not trend, but, but standard, I can say are the universal IDs. The universal IDs are basically encrypted, consented to users, like opt-in users, which the publishers uh, share those users with ID vendors, such as like LifeRamp, for example. And those ID vendors do pass those um, encrypted device IDs to the DSPs. So the DSPs do actually see the association level with universal IDs, which then increases the value of your inventory, basically. Uh, I can say opt-in users, the CPM generated from opt-in users are around twice the amount of uh, eCPM that are generated by not opt-in users. Uh, the third one would definitely, am I, am I shouting too much, by the way? I'm like holding the microphone right now. Uh, contextual targeting actually has made a comeback. I would say it, it's been there. It's some, not something new, but it is something that advertisers uh, and publishers heavily rely on. But uh, you, in order to um, have a performance or see performance or optimize your campaigns, the contextual information has to be vast in a net network so you can actually measure the effectiveness of it. And accordingly, that brings us to the importance of brand demand, because brands are used to uh, buying contextual traffic, which is something that I suggest publishers not to overlook. Like they can look into um, ad networks that has high brand demand, I would say, because they are like less affected by the by the CPMs. And lastly, I also see a trend of cross promotion increase, like. Publishers do rely on cross promotion in regions where they have less fill rates, so they definitely fill that fill those uh, impressions with with their own impressions, their own ads. Um, yeah, just following from what you were saying there about like ATT and the impact that has seen across the industry and like IDFA and all of that kind of privacy stuff. Um, as a company, Kindred, we've not really been impacted by that. Um, what we do is very different. We don't require people to opt in. We They opt in to turn on the feature, but that's like a totally separate thing. It's 
um, not opting into cross up tracking or anything like that. It's um, so for us directly, we've not really seen the impact of that. But what I do think is quite interesting is that I think that this has made us as an industry think about the fact that our users do care about their privacy and people do care about their data. And I think in a way that is a good thing because people do like that is their data. They own that data. So I don't think it should just be a given that we have access to that. And I think it's interesting now from our perspective to think about what can we do to provide still relevant ads when we have less data on our users, right? So for example, um, it's, I think in order to provide like personalized advertising experiences, it's more difficult than it used to be. And what we can do as a company, Kindred, what we can do is help um, kind of build personas on your users based on their shopping experiences. So we can tell you that say 80% of all of your users shop at Target. And then say you wanted to have, you then know that those kind of brands resonate well with your users and it kind of helps you to build more data on your users. And I think we need to think creatively as an industry about how we can still provide our users with relevant and personalized advertising experiences without impacting their data privacy. And I think we all need to like think outside the box about ways to learn more about our users in a data to secure safe environment. I don't know how to say that. Without but. infringing on exactly, any of the exactly. GDPR or, you know, exactly. obviously post IDFA, the whole, you know, gathering reliable, structured, um, you know, directed data has been challenging for publishers, gamers, developers, uh, you know, engine providers, whatever. Uh, it's been very challenging for everyone. But yeah, I, I can definitely see the challenge there as well. Um, would you like to talk about the uh, long term trends as well, since we didn't answer that bit? Or we can start with Holly, it doesn't matter. I just want to make sure the order doesn't get mixed up. Thank you. So yeah, long term, uh, I think it's more interesting to to talk about because uh, there is another trend, but uh, you know, it's true for, for every everything that uh, everything has an end. <laughs> so I think uh, the users will not be willing to, to watch ads forever. That's for sure. Um, the only question that uh, how long they are willing to to watch ads for, for example, for getting game content like uh, like rewarded video, uh, but the counter example of uh, the the playable ads, for example, I think this this is quite good because the users can interact. So there is this is a there is a a point for the users to to use it and uh, you know get uh, some insight about the game before they download it mm -hmm. but uh, in the, in the long term not just new formats of ads have to come but uh, new monetization methods have to come into this industry because uh, apps as we um you know mostly all of us just experience experiencing this uh this uh cpi is you know increasing in the last uh one year, it's uh, almost uh, you know not just doubled, but but quadrupled yeah, quadrupled yeah. In the just comparing with the last year, so of course we need to follow uh, with the TV. And uh, as you all mentioned before, that uh, it's getting more and more interesting for publishers and from game developers uh, that not the CPI and how we acquire user, but how we can monetize the users in the long term. And uh, I think uh, that our solution uh, uh, could be a uh, kind of pain killer <laughs> for that. Of course, uh, we cannot promise that uh, you know it will uh, has a good effect uh, on all the games and uh, for all the publishers. But uh, that's why we you know just develop this test game, which I mentioned before. So it's really easy access for for everybody uh, who you know, well, just get involved to the to the mobile game industry. So yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, so um my views are not very much different compared to the short term solutions, but what 
I hear from publishers generally is that they're looking for a higher transparency when it comes to admediation platforms, for example. Like when they see a general eCPM drop and they say that they're not being informed very well, so they're expecting more um, information, more transparency from the industry. So they wouldn't have to go to each uh, ad network separately and trying to find out why the uh, eCPMs drop. And in an ideal world, I would say we would like create a pool of first party data, but that wouldn't be that uh, realistic, to be honest. So I think publishers will seek ways to monetize their uh, already existing users more so like combining finding the right balance between in-app purchase and uh in-app advertising will be the main trend in my opinion um yeah just to add to that i think gary and what you were saying there about will users watch ads forever probably not i do agree with that but at the same time i do think if we're talking about just hyper casual and not kind of new forms of hyper casual turning in to hybrid or whatever different types of monetization included like i do think hyper casual games like ads are such a core part of that user experience like it's so entrenched in what you're used to so i think as much as they might be like disruptive to the user experience of course i just think as for hyper casual as the future of hyper casual it it will contain ads like that's kind of like part of the user experience and like those traditional ad formats will remain i think but obviously accompanied by other solutions as well. Um, I do think kind of what you were saying there about a mix of IA and IAP and hybrid model will definitely start coming kind of more popular. Um, and I do think like then will the game kind of core game experience change? Because if you're going to start including IAP, like, what is the motivation for the player to want to purchase something in a hyper casual game that they're maybe only going to play for two days? Like, is that then just basically becoming a casual game? Are they going to, you know, they have to have some sort of motivation to want to make a purchase because to them watching an ad, you know, they might just turn it on and the ad comes on and they think, okay, cool, just leave my phone there for 30 seconds or whatever, or X out of it as soon as possible. But I think if they're actually going to put like money into it, as kind of speaking to your solution, they have to kind of get something out of it. So if they are going to make a purchase within the game or put money down and then they should be entering a competition to win something or, you know, I think there's more to it than just adding IAP because I don't think that would necessarily work. Like I saw some stat the other day that was like 3% of people in the US would say they would make an in-app purchase in a hyper casual game because it, there's no motivation to do so at the moment, but then it might just become a different genre by itself. Um, the other thing I would say is, yeah, new solutions are going to gain traction because I think there has to be kind of an element of progression through the game to kind of increase retention. If CPIs are so high and it's so difficult to acquire new users, then there's going to have to be something to retain our users within our titles. And in that case, the game itself, yeah, the hyper casual elements of being fun, easy to understand, quick to pick up, all of that might stay the same, but at the same time, there might have to be progression or competitions or other incentives to kind of want to continue playing to keep that retention. I don't think it's quite as simple as being like, we will retain our players, we will add in our purchases. But um, I do think that will happen for sure. Uh, I do think there will also be, it will be more important to look at the long-term value of each player. And like for us, you know, what's important for us is helping hyper-casual publishers increase that lifetime value, increase the amount of revenue they get per pay. And I think what I was saying at the beginning, where as our company, these players turn on the browser extension, they shop, and then every time they shop, they, the publisher continues to earn revenue, regardless of whether or not they're still active players of the game. So that's where I think we kind of stand out from other solution providers in that the player no longer needs to be actively engaged with your game. They no longer need to be playing. They no longer need to they just as long as the app is on the device if they've activated the extension the publisher continues to earn revenue and i think that's kind of huge in hyper casual because we're everyone's looking for ways to increase that lifetime value too and we don't even really need you to retain the players if that makes sense but yeah that's that's my thoughts yeah they don't necessarily have to be playing the game as no. soon as as long as they have the app installed the publisher's happy you guys are happy and they're shopping online and they're still you know benefiting from what they're the app has to offers 
uh, I could definitely see a lot of publishers would be willing to like where, uh, you know, go with that method. And that's definitely one of the moment topics of what we have. This is potentially a new method of ad monetization. And going back to what I said, going back to what Gary said, obviously, uh, lifetime values are going to become increasingly more important and sustainability. People aren't going to watch ads forever. They're not going to watch ads for like 40 years, 50 years. So there's got to be different methods to maybe supplement that, maybe change that, or maybe just help out with that regards in regards to this could be a tournament, a competition, or you could have uh, in-app purchases, but then obviously you would have to entice users to make in-app purchases in a hyper casual game that they're only going to play for two days. And then comes the, uh, well, this is all related to the next question that I have anyway, and comes the whole uh, hybrid casual, hyper casual type of date deals. So um, there's got to be changes both in our ad monetization techniques, obviously, and there are going to be changes within the hyper casual genre, whether we like it or not. Speaking of that, what do you guys think about the status of the hyper casual genre in general, how it is right now, how is it? And what do you guys think the future holds for the hyper-casual subgenre as a whole? Um, I, I can just start. Um, so I think as a genre, obviously, um, downloads have been decreasing. I was looking at some stats earlier. It's Q3 had 10% less hyper-casual downloads than Q2 this year. So that is the case. But at the same time, it did make me think, downloads might be decreasing but at the same time are players just moving to new environments new places to play games are they downloading from alternative app stores are they playing i don't know games like snap games or i don't know something like this are they just in different locations and we need to seek out those users in the right place i don't know um maybe that is hyper casual might become something people don't necessarily like download an app to play they just play in different apps if that makes sense in the future um, I also think, um, I have to look at my notes, I can't remember what else I was going to say, um, but yeah, in, in a way that's kind of easy to fix as well, like say players are playing in different stores, then you, there are people out there, there are companies out there that will help you get into these stores, I can't name one off the top of my head, but I'm sure there are many, um, and there are also, like localization in hypercasual is very easy, I was thinking about this, like there were not many words you know, <laughs> like it's pretty simple to play. Like you should be able to get this into a lot of markets pretty easily, which is, which is nice. Um, doesn't take a lot of like translation and localization. Um, then also more like in the future of the, um, of the genre itself, the subgenre of hyper casual. I agree. I don't know how long will it be around? You were saying in a few years, like, will people definitely want to watch ads? I don't know, like long, long term. Um, definitely agree that it will become more like hybrid and maybe closer to casual. I think there will be more kind of meta elements to a game, kind of what I was saying there, showing progression, showing like different, um, so people are kind of more engaged and it's not so much about acquiring as many users as possible and them just like moving through and moving on to your next title and maybe not churning out games as quickly, but becoming slightly closer to casual and having it as like a kind of longer retention and more more kind of to the experience for the user um and yeah i think yeah i think that's all my thoughts on this so i have a slight different opinion i don't get me wrong i i agree with everything you said i just uh through my experience i can say that the uh the trends just eliminated the studios that don't know what they uh what they are doing basically so like big big publishers are still scaling their their hyper casual games and uh, and hyper casual games are sourced by daily trends and as long as they're going to be daily trends they're going to be uh, someone that's building hyper casual obviously and the studios the publishers the big publishers especially uh that knows how to scale a game that know how which ad networks to use which ones have bigger demand in which region so they will still manage to to scale their hyper casual games but that is of course a fact that the trend is shifting towards um adding different genre elements to already existing hyper casual genre like mid core elements where competition is more important or idle elements where progression is more important which ends up in higher LTV and longer play times. But I don't think um, hyper casual will ever fade away. I hope not, at least. 
I hope not either. We're still developing hyper casual yeah. games, so yeah, it's, it's, there's real big problems if hyper casual fades away in the near future. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> that was my short answer. So yeah, I think hyper casual games so uh, has a bright uh, future. Oh, uh, just we need to adapt uh, the game, and uh, we need to adapt the content. Uh, I was uh, in a panel discussion uh, before that, so uh, the Tap Nation. Hi. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, what the studios need to change in the last couple of months, how they should uh, develop uh, the games uh, in, a, in a new way to to increase the, the time screen, what the users spend uh, with the games. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, we will see not... Not so soon, but we will see that uh, some some hyper casual games so uh, we reach the two billions uh, in installs because uh, the the stakeholders of the industry are very professional, and uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, we will figure out uh, the content uh, what the users uh, want to consume and uh, want to you know watch ads or uh, pay for. Uh, by using enough you know, purchases, uh, of course, uh, the the competitions and tournaments. Uh, it's also a uh, good. Uh, it, uh, it could be also a good uh, new uh, way, how uh, you know, just making the game more interesting and uh, more more exciting, because uh, you know, just uh, trying to. Uh, you know, uh, from our perspective, from Real Money Gaming, uh, because the, this, uh, you know, this uh, experience with uh, with FIFA was so strong <laughs> in my life. So, yeah, playing for for Real Money, it's it's something uh, really exciting. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the the number of devices is growing rapidly. So that's why uh, it's another reason why I'm sure that. Uh, the number of installs uh, will increase as well um, in in the long term. Of course, uh, we are experiencing this uh, this increasing uh, CPI, but uh, with new content and uh, with new features, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, we will stop this trend. I definitely agree. Uh, go ahead if you have something to say. Oh. Definitely agree with. Uh... Uh, what's been said. Uh, if there's one thing that we can all agree on, that's that CPI rates are going up and uh, it's becoming more costly to get people to install apps, games, and whatever. Um, and obviously, there needs to be a change in uh, dynamic here. Uh, maybe, like you said, make the games more enticing or more interesting. Uh, do you think we need to implement a uh, similar approach to ad monetization and marketing strategies as well? Do you think that needs to be changed? And uh, have any of you started to experiment with different methods or more unique methods of advertisement, like playable ads, like you mentioned, or surveys or crowdfunded stuff, or maybe different, you know, more unique strategies, more unique methods. Have, has any, have, it, have any of you experienced with something similar like that? <laughs> Your time to shine. <laughs> yeah, so um, what I can say is that we've, as, as Immobi, have seen two rising um, new methods of ad monetization, one being the blended in-games. That is also one of the reasons why we partnered with Anzu. For those who don't know, Anzu is one of the biggest blended in-games uh, ad networks in the world. So um, it's, it's operationally easy to uh, implement those, those impressions in, into the blended in-game zones. That's why uh, it's also growing so fast. So you don't need to necessarily create a, create a new project, new displays. Uh, you can just serve your uh, already ex existing displays in the, in the billboards that the games have uh, programmatically. And also you don't have to choose the, between traditional ad placements or blended in game you can just add that element to that or to your hyper casual game even like so you can just like place billboards and um from the publishers that i've uh, talked to they said that they've seen about 10 to 15 percent revenue increase adding that placement on top of the traditional ones and it's a 
brand safe environment so it can be viewable i mean the viewability can be measured by third party partners like mode is so especially brand advertisers that heavily rely on awareness are leaning towards blended in games more and more and also i would say around 70 70 percent of the users according to a survey by the way i don't remember which survey that they uh, recall an ad that they see in a blended in game zone. Maybe it's because they associate it with the game that they love so much, uh, but it's it's a very effective way. And for the second one, I would say audio ads. I don't know if anyone had has had uh, experience with that. That I kind of find interesting, and I think it's going to be, uh, we'll see, we'll hear more about audio games, uh, audio ads in the future. Uh, the first reason, operationally, it's also very easy to uh, to implement those. You just need to upgrade your SDK to the latest version of the uh, ad network that you use, and you can just enhance that traditional banner zones and serve, start serving audio ads, basically. And it's pretty user-friendly. I think people have different opinions about it, but it's pretty user-friendly. Like It doesn't render if the sound is below 30%. And users can stop or pause the uh, audio whenever they want, and or if they reduce the sound below thirty percent, um, the app just stops playing. And the thing is, from a traditional banner zone, you can make eight to ten times more easy uh, CPM, eCPM. So we'll see where it goes from there. I actually have a quick question for you. Um, that was pretty on the spot, but just when you're talking about Anzu, it made me think. So with that, you have your like blended in-game ads. I'm totally with you that I think they are a really cool solution. Like for non-intrusive monetization, that is pretty user-friendly. And I can totally agree with you around seeing ads in your favorite game and thinking about them positively and all the brands. I totally get that. How do you choose though, obviously other than Anzu, which network to work with because if it's programmatic and they don't have mediation how do you know do you know what i mean like how would you choose which is the best ad network so the anzu deal is a specific special deal that uh Imobi has made before i actually started so i didn't have much to say uh, yeah, on that part <laughs> but i know they're what but they're actually one of the leading ones so and the regions they have demand kind of overlaps with the demand that we have so we thought it would be an effective way to start like from the apac region for example so where we could see immediate effect i was just wondering <laughs> blended in game apps once you mentioned it i recall something and that was very interesting and obviously um audio uh based ads those are definitely going to have a place in their market as well um something funny anecdote about gatorade i think they were one of the first to implement something like that in PUBG. A very popular game uh, so you take damage and there's like energy drinks that you can drink in PUBG to recover health points and Gatorade gave a, a blend in game ad so instead of energy drinks they were just like little bottles with Gatorade logos and it was insane it was such a huge success like great marketing strategy and I was playing PUBG on there and I was like man I could really go for some Gatorade right now you know I'm just taking damage constantly and chugging Gatorade drinks and it's definitely a, one of the more fun unique yeah. and new methods of ad monetization in the uh, current game market. So thank you so much for bringing that up. That's definitely one of the more interesting topics that I think we're going to be seeing more in the market. And I myself as a gamer, you know, I'm okay with that type of ad. Like you said, I don't want to watch 40 second ads, but I don't mind if the health potions turn into Powerade or something like that in my games. Like Non-intrusive. But... Not intrusive at all. No, it's, totally it's actually agree. a fun way of experiencing advertisement as a gamer myself. Very interesting topic. Thank you, thank you so much for bringing that up. Uh, we don't, as a company, have our own audience, uh, obviously. We are server spreader, but from our partnerships with other um, publishers, we can see like different uh, alternatives they've also tried out. Um, our solution is complementary to all, you know, IAA and IAP, uh, whatever strategy you go for, it's just another revenue source on top. So um, our partners do definitely work with loads of other solutions. Um, one that I find quite interesting is playables. I think as an advertising experience, at least as a user, you get to try out a new game. You get to play at the same time. You know, you're, you're there to play. You're in a game. So um, I, I do think they're quite interesting. And I did see a stat that said that even though they're obviously a relatively new format, that um, 
30% of publishers that have tried them say that they are now their most effective format. So I think that's quite exciting because that means that it's, uh, the new trends are successful and like are gaining interest and um, working. So I think that's cool. And I think it kind of reflects what we were saying about how uh, like traditional ads that might change over time and they might, uh, publishers might become more reliant on these alternatives or different formats. Um, the one thing with playables, I would say, I think they're really effective if they accurately represent the gameplay of the game they're advertising, if you know what I'm trying to say. The fake ones. The actually. fake ones are really difficult. And I think the same goes, though, for different formats, you know, not just playables. You know, there are loads of just video ads for games that look nothing like that once you download them. But I do think in order to make playables more effective, it would be great if they were slightly more representative of the game that they are advertising. Um, that being said, I still think they're really cool and a new solution, which is nice. Um, also, some of our partners, like we have this one partner that was talking about removing all ads from his game and just relying on our solution. I think um, that is really exciting for us, obviously, and could be something that happens in the future. I think a lot of the feedback that we have got from publishers in general is around the fact that our solution works externally to the app and it is non-intrusive. And in a similar way to um, blended in-game, it enables the players to continue playing and it's not interruptive and it's not kind of damaging the user experience. And I think I don't quite remember what the question was, but I think that could also be the future of monetization. I'm not quite sure if that answered this question, but a different one at least. It definitely does. Yeah, just just <laughs> add something real quick. Yeah, I mean, um, one other thing that you reminded me is the play and earn model. I think that's going to be on, on rise as well. So the industry tends to lean towards uh, new ad models, even if it doesn't perform better, necessarily perform better than, than the others. But... For example, brands are um, very to um, very open to test that first, like to be the they want to be the the one to test it first, so they can be media first. Uh, there can be media first projects for them. Yeah. So I would say we'll definitely see new models that even we are not very familiar with. So yeah, thank you, Holly, for enlightening us on that part. Yeah. Oh. I think uh, when an ad has any connection with the uh, with the gameplay, and if, if it's funny, then uh, you know that just mind blowing. So uh, what you mentioned, I never heard. But uh, of course, I played with PUBG uh, many times, uh, but I was so bad in it. So I always feel that you know I'm a noob. So I totally. <laughs> skewed that uh, game and uh, but at least I figured out that I'm more casual hyper casual gamer uh, but never heard that uh, marketing solution it's very cool uh, you know uh, if I remember well when you you know just bring uh, this uh, energy something and you know just an audio at what I can imagine that Red Bull which give wings <laughs> for, for example yeah. yeah it would be great but uh, mm, I have a good news uh, for for publishers because uh, our solution uh, we, yet they don't need to implement our so, our solution to their games because uh, we work there uh, we have a workaround for that. As I mentioned, that uh, you know uh, this real money gaming service, um, it's not as easy to implement into games as uh, ads or something like that because well, we need to follow the regulations, uh, the policies, uh, and there are many, really. I feel like you could give like an entire presentation just about the legal like surroundings of the situation because it's a very sensitive topic, isn't it? Like the whole like play and earn. No. No? <laughs> <laughs> just for a day. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, we went through a lot of, uh, you know, uh, difficulties. Uh, of course, so uh, we always followed the the policies and uh, the regulations. So uh, we we are always in talks with uh, UK Gambling Commission, uh, legal opinions. What we have that uh, what we are providing this is not gambling. So we uh, we good to go on on App Store, 
uh, for example, but uh, Google has a very strict uh, gambling policy, so we cannot publish uh, games uh, on on Play Store with that with uh, that kind of service. But uh, none of our competitors can. So, <laughs> but that's good news that Google is starting to change uh, their mindset on that, and uh, there is beta testing period uh, where we applied as well. So hopefully in uh, Q2 next year or Q3 next year, uh, they will uh, let this kind of business model to work on Play Store as well. But App Store is, you know, which is very, you know, uh, weird because usually Apple has this kind of mindset, uh, just this, so with uh, IDFA, uh, but anyway, it's just just a fact. So, yeah, um, I think uh, the the hyper casual genre it's it's more about a business model. Uh, when the publishers and game developers push the users to to watch as many ads as they want as as they can, and of course after a while. Uh, users delete uh, the app uh, and you know just uh, looking for something else. Uh, I think uh, our business model could be a new one for hyper casuals because uh, there is a crowd. Uh, you know this is the this uh, this is the most uh, popular uh, genre uh, amongst the uh, all the all the mobile games. So almost 40 percent of all downloads uh, was hyper casual last year and uh, that's the other reason why we designed uh, this price price pool crowdfunded without any limitations so yeah uh, we strongly hope that uh, we can prove for many of uh, you know publishers uh, that uh, this content could be the next Some definitely great insight on that topic as well. Um, we're almost gonna wrap it up here. Uh, I have just I just have one final question for all of you. Uh, we've talked about uh, we spoke about many different monetization techniques and uh, many different methods of advertisement in the mobile games industry. Now, do you think there's like a one type suits all type of deal, or do you think different game genres categories have different methods, different ad monetization techniques that work for them specifically? Uh, what do you think the idea here should be? Should we focus on one thing or should we diversify the, um, I guess, ad movements or methods based on the different genres that we're operating in? Is there like a one type rules above all type of deal or is it different for each genre? Um, well, it's a good question. I can talk about uh, from the real money gaming uh, perspective uh, because uh, we have been running this kind of business model for more than six years. So we supported PC, console, mobile games uh, as well uh, back in the years. Mm, but uh, actually, yeah, the strategy always uh, has to solve uh, the most challenging part that how you can motivate the users to, to risk their money because that, that's, uh, that's the biggest challenge on the real money gaming uh, service market. So I would say that, uh, yeah, this is one and only. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely a good question. But the short answer is, from my opinion, it's yes. All the genres have different working ad units for them, or like IAPs work for different genres. Obviously, if they uh, future, like for example, you can push IAPs in an arcade idle game because it has progression uh, mechanics in it, but not so much in in hyper casual, like Holly said. But in my opinion, uh, it's also very important for the studios, uh, Jean-Baptiste would definitely uh, agree with me, to know which ad networks uh, to use, what ad units they're uh, performing well, which regions they have the majority of their demand. It's pretty important. So I would definitely suggest to use an ad mediation platform, AV test, which ones are working, which ones are not. And also the competitive advantage actually for me lies in, in game design and how well the uh, studios are benefiting from data, how, how often the, or how well they um, analyze their users. Like for example, if, if the users 
are struggling at a certain level, just place a rewarded video there. It will perform way better compared to a, a regular rewarded video. Or for me, I would say I watch rewarded videos when that game offers me something that I really find interesting. So make uh, advertising and monetization a fun part of your game journey, in my opinion. So, Or give a, a different tool and really interesting tool they can use to pass that level. That definitely works for me, at least. And from an ad unit performance standpoint, I would say rewarded videos are, are performing very well for us. And <clears throat> like that's also because users like to have control over their that. So they, they don't pop up unless the user wants to watch them and they get something in return. That's how our brain actually functions. Once you get the taste of that reward, you keep um, wanting that reward basically. And yeah, pretty much, pretty much that I think sums up the, uh, the monetization strategy. That's like Holly said as well. Those types of ads are less intrusive when the user wants to, like when the user is incentivized to watch the ad to get the other thing that they want from the game. So I, I can definitely see exactly, how yeah. that would be more successful game than design. traditional methods. Yeah, game design and and observing that data and maybe on even user level, like uh, third party partners, uh, such as I think Game Analytics, do provide segmentation level of data, so you can uh, actually. Se segment your users and monetize them separately, differently, in different ways. I understand we don't have that long left, but I um, I totally agree with what you're saying there. I think it is it's about collaboration between game design and monetization teams, and it's about kind of how you can incorporate your monetization into the game to make it fun, to make you want to watch these ads, to make it part of the natural experience with that blended in game or um, different things like that. I think. I do think all like all types of monetization could be used across ca the, all categories. Um, I don't see why not, but I just think the revenue that will come from each will be different. So obviously in hyper casual, if you do incorporate in-app purchases and there's not a huge incentive to buy them, then probably won't get that much revenue from it. But, you know, it, it could be used. Um, I will say, though, I think that what we have created at Kindred is applicable to all um, genres, because basically when your user when your player, they make a purchase in their browser, we have an API that you could use to then reward your player every single time they shop online. So our API can be used that say they make a purchase at Adidas and for that purchase, they get 20 gems in game. And so say for like a more kind of a, a game with a stronger economy where having more gems is important to the user, then this can be used with our solution. This can be used to entice more retention more engagement but at the same time it can also be used for hyper casual like you don't need to do that it's it's an op it's an option and you can also just use the api to reward them for the activation of the feature or even like we work with publishers to offer um vouchers to their users so you could say something like activate our feature and be entered for the chance to win this or some you know win a hundred dollar amazon voucher or something like that and it's a competition for your users to entice engagement with that um with that feature so i think the way that you involve monetization it could be the same actual feature the same mechanic but it, just the way that it's used is different across different genres that makes sense that makes perfect sense good <laughs> well that about wraps up our questions um and uh, i think we made great time uh we have approximately 28 seconds for q a are there any questions no all right great um, <laughs> without infringing on anyone else's time. I don't know if there's going to be another presentation here or not, but um, I don't know if the hosts will allow us. If they do, we'll have a brief session Q&A. Do we have time for a Q&A or no? The other, all right, that's perfect. I love other guys that aren't here yet. That's perfect. So we have a few minutes for questions and answers. Having said that, I'd like to give a massive thanks to my panelists, my dear friends, colleagues. Uh, they've been amazing. And uh, personally, as an attendee as well, uh, this was quite enlightening. It was a very fun experience, and I got to uh, experience very valuable insights from people from different backgrounds within ad monetization and, you know, different, uh, obviously, uh, uh, incentives. Um, personally, for me, this was great. Uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, we got to go ahead. We have a few minutes for Q&A, uh, so go ahead. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I have a question. The, 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 
there's been a recurring topic about uh, intrusivity um, and ads uh, and how to make them seamless into the gaming experience. Um, so, of course, the biggest finger to be pointed is at interstitial ads. Um, how would you feel about a solution where um, you render interstitial ads as a smaller version of rewarded? Uh, for instance, like you could have a times five on your revenue with a rewarded ad, but times two with the five second interstitial, but just to make um, interstitials as a part of a reward and that would still be player activated. Is that something that could make sense and work or? Yeah. I mean, as far as I know, that already exists to a certain level. Yeah, I think there are rewarded interstitials. Yeah. And is, is there like any data insight on it or? I will take a look and share it with you after that. Right now, I Gladly. don't have it, but I, I know there are uh, rewarded interstitials. Yeah, the industry basically uh, thinks as we do as consumers, so they are trying to um, convert the already existing ad units to less intrusive ones. Like audio ads might be perceived uh, as intrusive, but at the same time, it leaves the control to the users. So pretty much, like you say, uh, I think the industry works towards that. Okay, nice.